I'm uh, super excited uh, for this opportunity to share the work of Community Education Group uh, that we've been doing around hepatitis C, uh, but also the work that we've been doing in the Appalachia region. My name is Tony Young. I'm the executive director and founder of Community Education Group. Next slide, please. What I like to think about is that there's a growing syndemic in the Appalachia region. For those of you that don't know, the Appalachia region is 13 states, with West Virginia being the only state in the Appalachia region. I like to say that there's been a train that's been roaring through that region, and that the engine of that train was originally injection drug use, became poly drug use, and we had a, a challenge with hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and hepatitis A. And we also have economic development challenges, workforce development challenges, and the caboose of that train being HIV. Many people don't understand or are unaware of the fact that Appalachia, uh, which is two, 26 million people, actually Kentucky and West Virginia have vacillated between one and two in rates of hep C infection. Uh, and one of the challenges that we see is that many people don't see these communities as vulnerable, but they are. They are vulnerable due to, again, economic development challenges, meaning that People see the Appalachia region and they think about coal mines, but many of those mines have shut down. And what has happened is those people are un unemployed or underemployed, and they are also experiencing increases in rates of substance use disorder. So if we put together substance use disorder, HIV, viral hepatitis, one of the things that we have is some of the most vulnerable people in the United States of America. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, the economic downturn, high rates of substance use disorder and overdose, along with the idea of isolation. And I wanna talk about that isolation for a moment. The isolation is often because we have uh, gone through things like COVID and we talk about COVID and what we've been able to do with telemedicine and telehealth. But the reality is, is that in some parts of the country, we still don't have access to uh, technology. We don't still have access to uh, those vulnerable people who are living in what we call hollers. And a holler is a, a small place on the side of a mountain where individuals may not even go out of that holler for uh, once or twice a year. And the reason that they wait, go out is to, to get food. Most of their information, most of their resources are brought into that holler, not going out. So when we think about kind of how it is that we're gonna access people or how it is that we're gonna talk about people, we have to think about who our community partners are. And that's one of the things that we really try to do at Community Education Group is develop new partnerships. Many people may know Community Education Group actually is an organization that worked in very urban environments. But again, we now work in a, an environment that's primarily rural, 26 million people throughout Appalachia. So I want to talk about that region for a second. Appalachia technically is from uh, Vermont all the way down to Mississippi. But what happened is, is that one of the things that President Kennedy, uh, when he was running for the presidency, uh, thought about was he, he went on a tour. And he did a tour of this region of the country. And what he realized was that health indicators poverty indicators uh, were abound in, in this region, that these folks were never gonna be able to access employment. They weren't gonna have good health if we didn't do something. So what he did is he actually created a, two things. He created the Appalachia region and he created the Delta region. And in these kind of two regions, what he looked at is poverty, and the ability to be able to access individuals. So there was no highway system in this part of the world. So he said, we have to figure out how we're gonna be able to get people information. Now, you know, it may not sound like it's important to, to health to have a highway system, but if you can't get people to and fro and off these mountains, you're not gonna be able to get them the healthcare that they need. And as you can see, one of the things that we keep talking about here is, is this isolation piece. So through Kennedy uh, and through uh, being able to develop a highway system, uh, people were able to get greater access to healthcare. But what he also realized was that some of the states had more access to, to resources than others. So that's why rather than all of the states along the Appalachia region, 
or all the states along the Appalachian corridor uh, being a part of the Appalachian system. What he did is he said, let's look at poverty and let's look at uh, income and let's look at the availability of other resources. So rather than it being all the states, it's only 13 states uh, with West Virginia being uh, the only state 100% as a part of the Appalachia region. But it is also critically important to remember that we're talking about 26 million people who are a part of it. Uh, and so as we talk about them, you know, we have a 400% increase in hepatitis C, uh, but we're seeing that not going down, going up. One of the things that has been kind of phenomenal over the, the last uh, particularly five to seven years is the support that this region of the country has received from uh, Gilead Sciences. And that's come in multitudes of forms, right? One has been the Hep Connect initiative. The Hep Connect initiative where it looked at harm reduction as a tool, harm reduction and supporting those harm reduction programs because hepatitis C, its connection to injection drug use, critical, right? The second piece of that is co-infection, people living with hepatitis C and people also living with HIV. Now, how do we do that? We've got to do a couple of things. We've got to relink those folks into care uh, that have been lost to care or don't have a diagnosis. But the other thing that we've got to be able to do is to get providers to be able to provide care. Now, I like to say, next slide, please. One of the things that I like to say is that we have to create new partnerships, as I said earlier. So one of the things Community Education Group has done is we've created the Appalachia Partnership Consortium. What we do is, is that we hold a monthly meeting with our federal partners, our local partners, local government, and community-based organizations. The other thing that we've done is really begin to talk about the advocacy of what we need to do to address hepatitis C, as well as to address other concerns. One of our big policy initiatives has been really to overturn the, what's called the OTP moratorium, the opioid treatment moratorium. Now, what is that? A place like West Virginia, which we just talked about kind of where it is in this epidemic or in this crisis, is that we have nine, only nine uh, methadone treatment programs in West Virginia. And we have now a moratorium that says we can't open anymore. That's kind of crazy uh, given the, the opioid crisis in the state. But people believe that the uh, methadone treatment programs are a, deter are a deterrent to recovery. They don't see them as a part of a toolbox for recovery. So we have really been trying to fight that, overturn that, and been working on that for the past three and a half years. Uh, and we've gotten far one year, and we got back stuck behind a bill. And then last this year, actually in session, we were told there's no way this bill's going to pass, and it got knocked out of committee. The other thing is that we've done is that we've created the Appalachia Partnership Fund, which again, I'm glad and proud to say that Gilead has supported. Uh, we did a million dollars in year one. Uh, we will probably do a million dollars this year as well uh, of giving uh, grants for everything from COVID to immunization to hepatitis C to for community events, for home testing, for a myriad of things for folks in this region to be able to address HIV, hepatitis C, and substance use disorder, as well as COVID and monkeypox. Um, one of the things that we think, and I think, and it's probably a very personal thing, is that I believe that we have to do a better job of getting our MAT providers engaged in this fight around hepatitis C, as well as HIV. And I lead with hep C because I believe that many of the MAT providers in this region and around the United States see themselves not as a part of our bigger fight uh, around hep C and HIV. But I believe that they're a critical partner in engaging folks into hep C treatment and cure, but also engaging folks and relinking them into care. And how do I mean that? Many MAT providers in the United States are small providers, meaning they are treating folks that are, you know, it's only about 25 patients to 50 patients. I'm not talking about large scale treatment uh, facilities, but small, particularly in rural communities, they're smaller providers. But if we can do a couple of things, if we can get them to see their role 
in curing individuals from HIV, if we can get them to see their role and not allowing folks to necessarily opt out. Because many states have policies that say, if you go to an MAT provider, you're required to get screened for HIV and for hepatitis C. So what we wanna do is say to them, you play a critical role in our ability, not just to treat, but to cure, not just in our ability to screen, but in our ability to get folks to undetectable. And so we think that they don't know that. And we think because we've left them out, we've left them out of our educational opportunities, we've left them out of our training opportunities, and we really want to do more of that to bring them in. And often it's, I think sometimes it's because folks see them as quote unquote medical providers. And they're not really, they're medical providers in a different way. And I think we have to see them as such. And secondarily, I think the what's happening in the United States right now, uh, for many of you that uh, may or may not know this, is that we are in the process of settling uh, the big opioid uh, uh, settlement dollars are being distributed throughout the United States. Now, this is going to be billions and billions and billions of dollars. Much of this money was on the backs of people that were are living in these hollers and living in small towns and some of them in urban environments. But the challenge right now is to understand where that money is going and how that money will be distributed. Uh, the money, the funds are coming state by state. Uh, they are not coming through uh, traditional means, uh, health departments, et cetera. They're coming through the attorney general's office. Uh, they, each state is coming up with a different structure of how to uh, distribute and disseminate those dollars. Uh, many states are looking at uh, putting all of that money into uh, treatment or into additional policing. Uh, and we're saying, you know what, there's prevention costs here. Uh, there's treatment education costs here. And we wanna really work with states and with others to, to uh, be able to, to kind of make sure those dollars go to the, the appropriate place. Uh, one of the folks on our team, uh, Trisha Christensen, has given presentations now, uh, actually in Australia, uh, as well as to the National Governors Conference, because she's created this large dashboard of what's happening in each of the states. Um, so we think that that's a critical piece that we really need to be uh, thinking about. And again, immunization, right? Why is that important? Because I think we think that it's another place where we can get people early on thinking about care and treatment whether that's monkeypox immunization or whether that's early childhood immunization where we can get families in to begin to think about prevention. Because that's what we think with, particularly with hep C is that with hep C, we have folks that are living with hepatitis C, but what we've got to do is be able to get them in to be screened for hep C, then come in for treatment and follow-up for hepatitis C. But again, we think that if we can create a network for them, we can do that right and well. Next slide, please. Uh, again, as I said earlier, I think the key thing I really want folks to take away from all of this is, again, we've got an amazing support uh, from Gilead Sciences, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the work that we do. In this photo, I'm here with two of the folks uh, that we do a lot of work with, particularly around harm reduction uh, in West Virginia and throughout the Appalachia region from the West Virginia Rural Health Association uh, and from the Harm Reduction Network. Uh, here. But again, I just want to close on this idea around MAT providers. While they may be seen as medical providers, uh, which I think some companies like to move away from, I think the reality is, is that many of them are small practices that were started in a behavioral health space. So let's really think about how it is that we can reframe kind of working with MAT providers to serve as the hub of how we access folks uh, with living with hepatitis C and ensuring that they come in and that they get their full scale of treatment so that we can get them to cure. Because uh, I believe that if we use MAT providers, we can substantially increase our cure rates uh, across not just the United States, but frankly, across the globe. Again, thank you for the opportunity to share a bit about what we do. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to share uh, our, our, again, our ongoing support for the work that Gilead does and the work that Gilead has done with us. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, from Community Education Group for sharing a wonderful presentation about the work you're doing in the Appalachia region of the United States. My name is Chanel McGoy, and I am a senior director in, at Gilead Sciences and Public Affairs and Corporate Giving. And I am so delighted that you were able to share some of the amazing work you've done. And I, I'd like to take a little bit of time to ask you some questions as well. What are some of the main successes? We heard a tremendous list of work 
that you have done in this region, but what are some of the main successes or key successes that you would highlight for us? You know, I thank you uh, and thank you for the opportunity to share our work. Uh, I definitely think that the partnership development that we've been able to do uh, in the Appalachia region, you know, many people uh, told us we were crazy when we said that we were going to do uh, come to Appalachia uh, and we were going to do work in the HIV, viral hepatitis, substance use disorder, or the syndemic space. They said, you're nuts. Don't do it. You're bananas. But I would say that over the past, you know, five years, six years, we've made huge inroads. And I think in part it was because it's, it's hard work. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it was work that no one was doing. And again, you know, and I and I'm not saying this just because I'm on the, on this call with you, but I got to tell you, it was Gilead who came to the table and said, OK, we'll we'll help you figure this out. You know, when Gilead came up with the Hep Connect um, initiative, I you know, and I, I could tell a whole long story about the beginnings of Hep Connect and the people that were in a room one day that were talking about what were they gonna do about harm reduction in this region, understanding its direct connection to hepatitis and its potential connection to HIV. And I gotta tell you, Gilead listened. Uh, there were some people at first who were like, no, 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 we don't think so. But then as the numbers and the data kept coming in, it was like, this is gonna be a bigger problem. And I have to say that Gilead responded. And so we don't live in silos, the way that the world is set up, the way that things just happen um, is not in silos. So I wanted you to speak a little bit more about syndemic and the importance of addressing not just one condition like HIV, but also harm reduction and substance use and hepatitis and how those come together for the way that you've been able to share strategies across for the syndemic. You know, it, it you know what's the irony of the syndemic in in our work in the quote unquote syndemic of HIV, viral hepatitis and substance use disorder in this region of the country is twofold, right? First part of that was we are in a part of the world that is red red red. Uh and what I mean by that for those of you around the globe is that means it's very conservative. Uh, it's conservative politically, it's conservative leaning, it's conservative in its thinking, uh, it's conservative in every, pretty much every way you could kind of think of. And we needed a way, number one, that we could talk about these things, HIV, viral hepatitis, sex, uh, that would not offend people. And so we said, first of all, let's reframe the conversation because we couldn't walk into the front door having a conversation about HIV or having a conversation about hepatitis or in some cases, not even having a conversation about substance use disorder. HIV, hep C, people don't want to talk about it because they think of communities that they don't necessarily support. Uh, substance use disorder, many people are in this part of the country are really tired of talking about it. So we had to think of a word. What's the word that we could come in with, begin to have a conversation with you, and it was 15 minutes into the conversation till you realize what we were talking about. So let's lead with syndemic, number one. That's to get us in the door and have a conversation. But the other thing that we wanted to do is to be able to be in a position to have that conversation with individuals who were in workforce development, have that conversation with folks that are in economic development, folks that are in rural health, rather than just saying, we're only going to talk to HIV folks, or we're only going to talk to hep C folks, we needed a way. And so number one, using the language and using the word syndemic, but then also educating folks on how all of these things are related. It's like, I like to say, it's like a train. All of these things are connected, but we have to figure out a way to make sure that we address each one of those cars along the way. Uh, the next question that I wanted to ask you is really around some of the main challenges that you faced and have overcome in the work that you do? Huh. Well, I mean, it depends on where you want to start because, you know, 30 years in, there's been a lot of challenges. But, you know, I think that, you know, one of the things that I always like to think about is, you know, and it, it's not hep C specific, but it is, but to me, it kind of is. And that is when we were able to get, uh, a national AIDS strategy passed, 
right? And get it through, get it bonded. And then we got another one done. And then this last one, we were able to get into it, language around the Appalachia region. Who would have ever thunk that? Nobody, right? And that's where the kind of the policies play a role. And I think that that's critically important. But in the initial, in the first national age strategy, there is a, is a line, it's probably more than a line, and I will misquote it, but hopefully not butcher it. But what it says is that in order for us to address HIV, and I say HIV and hepatitis C, in the United States of America, it is going to take not just our federal partners, but it's going to take federal partners, state partners, community partners, faith-based partners, individuals living with, individuals impacted by. It's going to take all of us, right? And I think when I when I read that, that became my my battle cry. So that meant that we can't move in any situation, in any direction, that we don't have all of those partners at the table. We don't have all of those partners in our thinking because it's not that we have enemies out there. I don't think that. I don't think that way. I don't operate that way. I think that we have people that we haven't made our partners yet out there. And once we can educate them about what it is that we need and how it is that we are actually aligned, um, you know, I think that when we do that, then we can win. But I, you know, one of the things we be keep thinking about is how is it that we can help small community-based organizations, not just in rural communities, but throughout the country, figure out how to, they can access local and state government access federal partners, because it's critically important for those organizations and institutions at the federal and state level to know what those folks are going through on a daily basis. Because sometimes I think they think they know, but they don't know. So if you had to identify, you know, one key strategy or approach that you've used um, that you think could be scaled up and replicated, what would that be in, in your region? That, that would be the utilization of people with lived experience through community health worker models and others to re-engage and re-link folks into care, right? And the, and the reason I say that, I think that at, my, at a high level, I believe that uh, MAT, medically assisted treatment providers, that's the folks that are providing uh, buprenorphine and other medical treatment to address substance use disorder. Uh, and I don't know kind of how those models work in other parts of the world. Um, but I think that those providers have been really kind of left out of our response. But I think if we connect them with people with lived experience and have those folks re-engage people that have been lost to care, lost to follow up. What we've seen is whether we use this model in Washington, DC, where we trained over 200 people doing this, right? To train them to go out into the field and do rapid HIV, rapid hep C, and then relinking an individual to care. What we saw is a 96% increase in the ability of the person to stay on treatment, to be in treatment, to get to the place of being undetectable. So we know that we can increase cure rates and we know that we can increase the ability for an individual to be un undetectable. So I think that one of the things that we've got to do is figure out if we're going to be committed to using community health worker models and using folks with lived experience. Many people think, oh, a person's not going to test with somebody that they know or some, but it's the opposite. Actually, it's like, I'm going to trust you because if you are the one coming to me saying, hey, this is what you need to do, then I think that people have a, a, a better chance. So, for example, like I said, we've done this in Washington, D.C. In that case, we were training individuals who are primarily African-American, primarily male, histories of incarceration, people living with HIV and people living with Hep C. We're now doing a similar model in, in West Virginia, and it's folks with lived substance use experience, living with hepatitis C, or living with HIV. And so they're going out and they're doing a very similar thing where they're saying, hey, we need to relink you to care for hepatitis C, or we need to link you to care for HIV. So we need to do this level of screening to get you back into care. Our first round, it was in one of the most, again, we're new in this region. People don't understand this kind of stuff. DC is a place where science and technology and HIV is outreach. All this stuff's been done for 30 years. This stuff is brand new in this part of the country. So one of the things we really have learned is that the first time we tried to recruit people to do this, 
we struggled. We got maybe 12 people. This time we have 120 people who want 10 slots. This is crazy. But I think that both providers as well as individuals get the value of people with lived experience being the ones to re-engage folks uh, into care. So I think that we need to scale up that sort of training. We need to make sure that we pay people uh, and that we uh, re-engage them into, into care and that they can see themselves as a part of the solution uh, where so many people and so often folks see them as the problem. Are there any final words that you'd like to leave with uh, the, those who are watching our guests? I mean, I think that, you know, the, the critical role of policy, you know, local, state, federal, whatever country you live in, you know, there are rules. Uh, and so making sure that those small organizations and institutions are aware of what those rules are and are a part of making themselves known to policymakers. And it's often hard for small organizations, whether they're in the United States or anywhere else in the world. Uh, but that's a critical piece of what I always try to challenge organizations to do. Uh, whether it's the executive director of that organization or a person in that organization to shake hands with whoever the local person is that's in, you know making decisions around health uh, up to the state and federal person who's making decisions around health. You don't always have a budget for it, but it's a thing that is an intangible that you have to do. It is a critically important because when a, a funding decision is going to be made, you want them to know you. Uh, you want them to know about you and you want them to know about your work. Uh, so that sometimes it's it's just as simple as you send them a cookie. Uh, and sometimes that's exactly what we do. We send them a cookie. Um, and so that's what I like to say is that partnership is important uh, and you can't do this work without partners.